Okay, so we are on uh, example number six, guys. Example number six <clears throat> of conversion stories. This puts us in Acts chapter 10. If you got your Bibles, we'll start there. Acts chapter 10, Peter is sent to Caesarea. <clears throat> uh, Caesarea, anytime you see Caesarea in the Bible, you should think uh, the Roman army. Because Caesarea uh, is where the uh, Pontius Pilate would have been stationed, the Roman army would have been stationed, and they only traveled into Jerusalem uh, for special holidays to make sure there were no riots and n no one getting out of hand. So Peter is sent there in Acts chapter 10, and let's go ahead and read <clears throat> what Peter does with Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion in the Roman army, a high-ranking official, and Peter is told to go down and meet him. We know that before uh, Peter goes to meet a Gentile, and we've talked about this a lot with Romans, whole big issue with the overlap of Christianity between Jews learning that it's okay to hang out with Gentiles. By this time, Peter obviously wasn't convinced of that, so Peter sees the sheet come down out of the sky with all kinds of animals on it, and God tells him to kill and eat whatever he wants, and Peter goes, no way, Lord, I have never defiled myself <clears throat> with any of these animals or any of this food. So, uh, you know, I think in the sermon last week, we saw something similar to that when Daniel said, and when they took him to Babylon, Daniel said, can you please ask the king if he would allow us not to defile ourselves with the king's meat and the king's <clears throat> wine? So that was a big deal for the Jewish person, but Peter sees the vision three times, and finally it says, whatever God has called clean, uh, do not call unclean. So let's pick up the story, Acts chapter 10 and verse 27. He has to go tell Cornelius, a God-fearing man, a message. <clears throat> so what's also interesting is the fact that he's already a God-fearing man. There was still a message that he needed to hear, and that's the message we're going to read about. Uh, we should think about that. He was already God-fearing, already wanting to please God, already living a lifestyle of trying to please God. And yet there's still something he needed to do. That's good to know as we read this account. So let's read it, Acts chapter 10 and verse 27. As he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered there. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So there was more to the vision of the blanket of the meats being let down than what met the eye. Not only were meats not considered clean and unclean anymore, but people were not considered clean or unclean anymore in terms of gen Jews and Gentiles. So I should not call any person uh, clean or unclean or common <clears throat> uh, or unclean. If we move on to verse about 39... We'll want to pay attention. This is a, a conversion story, even though Cornelius is already God-fearing. It starts in verse 39, chapter 10 and verse 39. Uh, and let's pay attention to what types of things he brings up to Cornelius. Verse 39, And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. <clears throat> 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from amongst the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. 
for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to remain for some days. Uh, sixth conver oh, did I say sixth or seventh? Conversion story, the sixth conversion story. And really, we haven't ever, whether it was a Jew being converted or a Gentile being converted, the approach and the system was still the same. Notice that it took for Peter a little extra proof that the Gentiles were allowed to come in to the faith because he was uh, apparently withholding the idea of baptizing them until the Holy Spirit poured out on them as he did all the rest of them. Uh, so the Jews and the Gentiles are being saved the same way. If we go forward to Acts chapter 11, if you'll be turning to that, um, Peter is going to go back to Jerusalem and retell the story. Well, sorry, first, why don't we just review what we saw here? He preached Jesus crucified and resurrected. Um... The Holy Spirit fell on them early to give Peter proof that they were included. And next they were baptized with water um, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at one more detail. When we turn to Acts chapter 11 and Peter is retelling what happened uh, there in Caesarea, he adds one other little detail. So verse 18 these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Repentance that leads to life. <clears throat> yeah, repentance that leads to life. So, if we were to add, I didn't give you the other little details I should have uh, from Acts chapter 10, but if you look at the whole story, <clears throat> From Acts 10, it looks the same as it always has. Uh, the, he, he preached Christ. Uh, they were baptized. And then Peter gives us this extra little detail. They were granted repentance. And what does repentance do? In that, in that verse, according to that verse, Leads to life, leads to the forgiveness of sins, uh, um, which is exactly what Isaiah had told them would happen. <clears throat> Number seven. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, let's see, so that's Peter. Um, that's the way Peter uh, taught the gospel. We see Peter doing conversions. Paul now, we studied that Paul said that he was an example of how God saves people. Paul goes down to Philippi in chapter 16, um, and this is what begins his first missionary journey. What's interesting about Paul doing this is as Paul is traveling, he sees a vision from a man that says, come over to Macedonia. Macedonia. Very good. So Macedonia, this is going to be a terrible little map, but... This is Asia Minor. This is uh, where all the seven churches in Revelation, this is where they are. This is Israel, Jerusalem. And then across the water here, I don't know how to draw this, but anyway, across the water here, you have this land here. This is what's known as Macedonia. Which became Greece. And, 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 and attached to it is also Greece. So, um, you have Paul going down to Athens at some point. That's down here. And up here, I forget the order, but you've got Thessalonica. You've got uh, the Bereans. Down here, you've got Corinth. Uh, who else is in there? <clears throat> so, oh, Philippi is somewhere in here. Philippi, Galatia is going to be in Asia Minor, okay. yeah, uh, and Ephesus, 
will be over here as well. So these are the churches now that Paul is going to get to head over to. Uh, and he's told when he's here, the Holy Spirit warned him, do not teach here. So he comes back on his second missionary journey and gets these guys. But he's told to go over here because some guy is waiting for him. Uh, Corinth, Athens, Thessalonica, Philippi. So as he goes over there, we're going to witness number seven, the conversion of Lydia. And this time, Paul is going to be the one doing the conversion story. And of course, there's a lot of people that think Paul didn't believe in works of any kind. So repentance and baptism and all that are, are anathema according to Paul's theology, they say. So we're going to watch what Paul does to convert somebody. Paul goes, let's look, pick up in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And we'll pick up in verse 14 with Lydia. Um, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her and her whole household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful, uh, come to my house and stay. A couple of things that we want to make note of. She was in Philippi. She was in Philippi. She was from Thyatira. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know what that was. Uh, let's see. So Philippi, what's going to be important here is we're going to witness how Paul planted the church in Philippi. And uh, Luke, as he records the event, Acts chapter 16, did you notice how concise the account mm -hmm. was? What, 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 what information do we have about uh, her conversion story? She was Isn't it interesting that for Paul to be the guy that suggests, people suggest no works, justified by grace alone through faith alone and yet Paul is the one in his account the only thing we're told about her conversion story is that after Paul spoke to her she was baptized now in, in my mind and my thinking Paul is all about grace and justification and righteousness and all those big what I called uh, uh, I forgot what I called them buzzwords and in this conversion of Lydia, the only piece of information you get is that she was baptized. To, to me, in my mind, uh, that just seems to communicate a lot to the reader. Now, if we're following along and, and we know that Luke is recording a history, and in, these, in this day, um, the rhetoric, the way to communicate effectively to people, he's recording stuff, but if he already gave two or three exploded examples of what a conversion looks like. Does Luke need to continue giving us these huge exploded versions of conversions or can he just sort of condense? That's exactly. You know, it does say though, at least in this one, Yeah. it does say before uh, it gets to the statement about her being baptized. She was a worshiper of God. Already yeah. was a worshiper of God. That's good to so know. So then you, then she, Lord opens her heart. She's heard something. That wow. She make this decision. So awesome. Where, where is that, Georgia? It's in verse 14. She yeah. was a worshiper of God. Okay, good, good. So Georgia picked up on verse 13. Uh, the end of 14, sorry, says... Lydia, who was a worshiper of God. So she was already worshiping God, uh, just like Cornelius was. And she, she needed to hear this new message. Was she a Gentile? Ooh. No, couldn't. No, I want to say that she was down by the river with a, a bunch of other ladies. Gathered praying. Yeah. Gathered praying. My understanding of that, down by the river, gathered praying, if you didn't have at least 12 men that were the heads of 12 families you didn't have a synagogue. So there was no place for Jews to meet. 
So what they would do in that case without a synagogue is they would just meet at a local river and they would pray. And so apparently... Outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Yeah. So Paul knew that they would be gathering, but uh, there weren't enough men to... And it does say it was women that were gathered there. And that was all women. Yeah. It also says on, on uh, 14 that she took heed to what was said by Paul. Evidently, he was telling him about Christ. Yes, she took heed. There was something she needed to do. And what it was is what Isaiah said. One day, uh, uh, the voice of one calling in the wilderness would come, uh, preaching a repentance of baptism. And that's part of the message she was offered. Although in her case, we add to that Jesus' death and resurrection. So good, good, neat things to make note of. Tiny, tiny little group here in Philippi. Um, eventually, Paul is going to write a letter to the Philippians, right? So whatever we read in the letter to the Philippians, it would be good if we already understood what the conversion story of the Philippian church looked like. That's something you won't get in Philippians. So that's, those are good things to tie together here. In chapter uh, 16, we're seeing the establishment of the Philippian church. And we see how it was done. Paul is going to get in trouble for doing this. Let's go to number 8. Paul is going to get in trouble and he gets put in jail. And so Paul figures, well, while I'm in jail, what? Paul says, well, if I'm in jail, I may as well convert while I'm in jail. We're going to bounce over to chapter 16 <clears throat> and we'll pick up uh, we'll pick up in verse 29, I think roughly. If you guys I, I just really kind of cut these short, guys, but if you notice something in the text that you want to bring up, feel free to look at it. So Acts 16, 29 <clears throat> And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Anytime you see that, guys, he's quoting Old Testament there. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Number eight, what must I do to be saved? And this is Philippi still, which is good for us to know. <clears throat> Again, preach to him, Jesus. Uh... What are the details does he give us? He said, the message was, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. He spoke the word of the Lord. That's our compacted phrase. The word is the story of Jesus. And then immediately they were baptized. So, Philippi. Now we know how the, Philipp, Phil, the Philippian church, the Philippian jailer and his whole family... Lydia and her whole family. Now we know how the Philippian church was planted. Uh, of Peter, I guess, uh, in chapter 2, 38, mm -hmm. it tells you all of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Philippian jailer. Uh, and that's Paul. That's Paul's con how he converts people. Let's go to chapter 17. Paul's going to travel down to Athens. Further, deeper down into Greece. And uh, I didn't number this as an actual conversion story, but Paul is going to give us one word that should tell us what he expected of these guys. So Acts chapter 17, 17, verse 29. Uh, Paul goes down and interesting how Paul approaches this. He sees a bunch of uh, idols and statues in Athens. And so he starts out the conversation saying, wow, it looks like you guys are very, very righteous. religious. You guys are very religious. You have all these uh, statues around here, so you must be worshiping. 
And he said, and I found amongst all the statues, one statue that was dedicated to the the unknown God, just in case we missed one. And Paul says, right now, I'm about to preach to you the unknown God. What a fascinating way to break in. So now we're in chapter 8, uh, sorry, chapter 18. I know, this, I know this God and I'm going to tell you about it. Yes, let me tell you about the unknown God. Chapter 18, and it's really neat um, how he said, uh, how he... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I jumped down to the next one. We're still in chapter 17 in Athens. We'll read it. But uh, look at how he convinces them of this unknown God. Okay, verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image that is formed by art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands that all people everywhere repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance. So what he gives us in that one, um, he said God commands men everywhere to repent. So my ears jump up at that. Repentance is nothing new, but Paul makes it, Paul, the one that says no works, faith alone, grace alone, uh, is saying, no, don't, 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 don't forget it. God commands all men everywhere to repent because, and he gives us another little twist on Jesus. What is Jesus going to do? <clears throat> yeah, now I, I would cross... Ah, uh, what's Deuteronomy? D-E-U? D-E-U? Yes. Yeah. Jesus will judge. Um, there's an important concept here. Deuteronomy 18, 18, and then Acts 3. Uh, in Acts 3, Peter repeats Deuteronomy 18, 18. So basically, Deuteronomy 18, uh, all the people have been gathered in the wilderness there at um, Mount Sinai and they're terrified of the voice of God because when, when God talks, the mountain shakes, there's fire, there's thunder. It's absolutely terrifying when anything approaches the mountain and gets too close, animals die. As soon as they get too close to the mountain, there's smoke around the mountain and the people say, please tell God not to talk to us anymore because he is so terrifying. We can't handle the reality of him. And so God tells Moses, hey, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that they've said this, because what I'm gonna do, Moses, is one day, what's that, 1818 or 1718? 1818. Yeah, that whole section is really fascinating. Um, but what he does is he says, one day, Moses, I'm gonna send a prophet like you, and it shall be, oh, what's going on? It shall be that anyone who doesn't listen to that prophet, what? Will be put to death. Put to death. Because people couldn't stand the voice of God, God said He would one day send a prophet that we would listen to. Someone that was like Moses, like ourselves. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 3, we'll see who that prophet was. Yeah. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, we can begin at about verse 22. Peter's uh, still preaching Christ, and he said that all these things that happened by the mouth of the prophets needed to happen. They needed to be fulfilled in verse nine, uh, 19. sorry, Verse 19, he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back so that your sins can be blotted out. There's repentance again. So that the Christ that's been appointed for you might return, or that God will send Christ back to us. Uh, Yep, and that is Jesus. There he is. Verse 22. Verse 22. Uh, 
Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, and you shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who doesn't listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. Uh, you, we can keep reading, but just read on down to verse 26. And God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So Jesus is the prophet, and the understanding is anybody that wouldn't listen to Jesus' words uh, would be uh, lost, excluded from the people. Um, and boy, there's all kinds of stuff that we can say about that. Mark, Mark 9, 7, let me... Where was... Uh, no, it's in Matthew, the end of Matthew. Yeah, uh, Matthew chapter 28... Uh, after Jesus' resurrection, he gives the grand commission to the apostles. Matthew 28 and verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you. Let's see, that was Paul in Athens. So basically when he says he commands all people everywhere to repent, um, that's, why, that's why we did all that little rabbit hole there, <laughs> because everyone is commanded to repent, yeah. Uh, let's go back to Acts 17 and we'll just finish up what Paul says in Athens. What Paul says in Athens, uh, Acts 17 and verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We'll hear you again about this. So when Paul went out of their midst, some men joined him and believed. So now we've got conversions in Athens. We also saw them in Philippi. So these little churches are getting planted and we're seeing exactly what they were taught and how they were converted. Let's look at Acts chapter 18. Paul is going to go to another city. What city is he going to? Uh -huh. And Paul writes a couple letters to the church in Corinth, right? So we are going to witness how the church in Corinth was planted. Uh, okay, Acts 18, we'll look at verse 4. Uh, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word one of our compacted phrases, testifying to the Jews that, G that Christ was Jesus. <clears throat> one of the conversion stories in Acts chapter 18, this is now going to be the ninth one. Again, this is Paul, Corinth. Uh, let's start in verse 8. While Paul was preaching at the synagogue there, he converts one of the synagogue uh, leaders. So Acts chapter 18 and verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, don't be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. 
He stayed with them a year and six months teaching the Word of God. A year and six months. And we know exactly what he taught them and how they responded. So whenever we read Corinthians, we'll want to remember how that church was planted. Uh, and notice how uh, compacted the phrases are. They believed, they were baptized, done deal. Let's see. Um, I want to. This isn't going to be a conversion story, but I thought it would be interesting to take a look at something that happens next. Paul's going to travel over to Ephesus. So these guys are here in Macedonia. Here's the water, and here's uh, Ephesus is right over here somewhere. So Paul spends a year and a half in Corinth. And he sets sail for Ephesus. But let's notice what does Paul encounter when he gets to Ephesus. Uh, Acts chapter 18 and verse 19. They came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went to the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. When he asked them to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next throughout the region of Galatia, Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, that's uh, Egypt, came to Ephesus. He was eloquent and he was competent in scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Now there's something quite profound. What's that? Yeah. Quite profound. Uh, let's see. I'm probably going to put this in the wrong place, but let's draw Africa right down here. Right down here is Alexandria. <clears throat> so a guy from Alexandria goes to Ephesus and it says that he taught accurately the things about Jesus, which tells us what about spread down there <laughs> the gospel was already down in Africa. I mean, these are such tiny little details, but uh, God's word was definitely going out to the world. So this guy is teaching accurately about Jesus. Uh, the story will get a little better here. Let's... Um, Accurately, the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. I would circle only because it sounds like to Luke, which is following, huh? Yeah, sounds like it, was not it sounds like it wasn't enough. These people had all... Wait, let me get before I... Yeah, so... Uh, we'll assume that um, Apollos and the, and the uh, people in Africa had been baptized. But apparently, according to Luke, there was a problem with that. Not necessarily a problem with that baptism. What was the issue? Incomplete. John the Baptist came teaching that somebody would come after him. So what we see is a pattern that when people were baptized into John, for repentance by John the Baptist, he said, you guys need to keep your eyes peeled for someone coming after me who's more important than me. And he is going to have a baptism now that you are going to have to be baptized into his baptism. So we would call this, uh, I don't know if you want to call it re-baptized or however you want to look at it, but there was something missing. What's interesting is... Yeah. Sorry. What were the words they called John's baptism? A baptism of repentance. And and Jesus' 
into the name of Jesus. Yes. So apparently, baptism, it looks like uh, to be submersed in the water, um, there is a, okay, uh, there's this Greek word, into. And the word means you were outside of something, now you're inside of it. So he got into his car. Baptism uses this word, and so you are baptized into Christ. So John's baptism was fine for his day because Christ hadn't come yet, and it was a baptism of repentance, which is what Isaiah told us about. But when Christ came, you need to be in Christ. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do you get into Christ Jesus? If you are, don't you know, Colossians, don't you know that when you were baptized, it says in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Colossians real quick, guys. I'm sorry, guys. Galatians 3. There is a baptism in chapter 2 of Colossians, but Galatians 3.27. Let's see if that's the one I wanted. Yeah. Is that it? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Yes. What, what, where is that? Chapter 3, what? 27. Galatians 3.27 uh, gives us this picture right here. So Galatians 3.27. Uh, I'll start in verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive by the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, that's the idea, in Christ Jesus you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You're not a Jew. You're not a Greek. You are one in Christ. And here is, I would put a verse, a circle around verse 29. Somebody read that to me. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to his promise. Yeah, if you are in Christ, you are an heir. Whoops. This is... <laughs> if you are in Christ, Abraham's offspring, Abraham's offspring, and you are heirs of the promises. Now this is a whole different topic, guys, but it is worth looking at. Galatians 3, 27 through 29. Who are Abraham's children? Anyone who is in Christ. You see, Paul taught us that Christ was the seed of Abraham. Where we miss the story here is because in Romans, we can be looking this up, the word seed in the Greek sperma is translated Abraham's offspring. And I think it would be easy to miss what's being said here. Let's go ahead and look it up. So we want to we want to find this a little earlier, Galatians 3, 16. We're going to find out about how Jesus is the one that creates Abraham's offspring. Um, okay, three, Galatians 3 and 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, is what that should say there. It does not say, and to his seeds as in plural, referring to many, but it refers to only one. And to your seed, who is who? Christ. Wow. So Christ is the seed that would be the heir of all the promises made to Abraham. Not his own children, but the promise came to Abraham and his seed. Now, how does that extend to the rest of us? Well, the seed was Christ. I'm going to put that here. And then as you continue reading, that's what we should have done. We should have read 316 first. 
after he talks about the seed being Christ, Christ is the one all the promises are to. When we continue down to Galatians 3.27, Ace, you're baptized into Christ. Therefore, if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's offspring and you are heirs according to the promise. So the only way to be part of Abraham's offspring is to stem out of the original seed of Abraham. These are who the recipients of the promises are.